Hey everybody, what's going on and welcome to GNR Central and today I want to talk about why Scott Weiland was fired from Velvet Revolver. Now there's a number of reasons why. A lot of people say that he was starting to act like Axel during the User Illusion tour and really becoming distant from the banning, sort of in his own little corner. So here's a good interview with Dave Kushner uh, several years back where he talked about Scott Weiland's firing and the events that led up to it. Kind of start to let <laughs> loose. Mm. I always have this fear, like I'm being too can, <laughs> but, but fuck it. You know what I mean? Like, uh, you know, really on the second tour is really when it, we had heard some rumblings that Scott wanted to do SDP. He had quit SDP or gotten kicked out one or the other right before Velvet Revolver. Mm -hmm. Then we were going along and then he started to, uh, and then we went, you know, from like 2002, late 2002 till 2006. So it was just on till then. But then we started hearing some rumblings of those guys. Like, I don't, I, you know, I honestly, I don't know exactly how it happened, but we started hearing rumblings of him wanting to do another SCP record or tour and stay in Velvet Revolver. That was the thing he wanted. He wanted to do both bands. And we were like, no. Yeah. Because it was too much. Like, And also because, to be honest, like, that's when things started getting segregated within the, the five. You know, like, he would, you know, especially after the second record, he was traveling very separate. You know, I think part of it was he was just doing his own thing. And, and he... Yeah. I don't know. You know, maybe he was afraid that we were going to be like, dude, what's up? Or whatever it was, or he just needed to be separate so he could do his thing, you know, when he was drinking or doing whatever. And and he he just got super segregated and he started getting super introverted. And he would, you know, and it was like a microcosm of how I heard GNR was in the end. Yeah. And so those guys had like PTSD basically yeah. from, you know, going through stuff that they went through with GNR and like waiting and him showing up late. And then, you know, I'm speaking of Scott, like he would show up late and then he would just not say anything to us and just like have to get ready and, you know, have sunglasses on. Cause that's what we were on stage. But you just felt like really dude, like that. No, we don't get nothing like no apology. No. Hey guys, I'm sorry. I'm late. I just fucking lost track of time. Or it was just like blank. Jeez. Like, here I am, fuck you guys. Like, that's how it felt. You know, like, all right, let's fucking play. You guys ready? Because I'm fucking ready. You know, and it just, it really felt not cool. And so we were getting more and more resentful, and and uh, he was getting more and more segregated, and, and it just fucking, you know, it just built up and built up, and we were just like, dude, you can't, you know, it's, it's, you know, there's a lot to it. There's, yeah. a, there's like, money issues. And then it's, like, you know, someone's renting a limo and in fucking... It's, like, stupid shit. Like, I'm gonna, we're going to go to New York. I'm going to rent a limo and drive around in New York, and then I'm going to charge the band for it. Mm. And the band was very, like, you know, aware. You know, so we were like, no, dude, you can't fucking charge us. That's your money, you know. Like I'm not paying for that, right? And that kind of shit too. So, you know, he, he could stay in different hotels than us, even, and it just got really hard, and it got really frustrating, and and we just the four of us were all on one bus, and he was on another bus, and we just started, you know, kind of talking and just being like, dude, we can't do this. This is too fucking, you know, it's too hard. Yeah. And so we, I mean, to be honest with you, we fired him, you know, and, and that was it. You know, we fired him. We had thought we could replace him and obviously we couldn't, you know. So what's funny about this whole Velvet Revolver split is that Ultimate Classic Rock, or I should just say Classic Rock Magazine was doing a story about Velvet Revolver on tour and they originally weren't even going to write a story about them breaking up because they were on tour. They were in Dubai in March of 2008, about a month before Scott Weiland's last show with the band. 
And you could tell in the article that things were really coming to a boiling point with the band. So they were in Dubai and they were talking about what was going on with the band. So they said that they were at the hotel. The guys were kind of relaxing. Uh, Dave Kushner, who arrived the night before and stayed up for hours talking to his pregnant wife via Skype, is asleep. Scott Weiland is, well, actually, where the F is Scott Weiland? So Slash, meanwhile, sits alone. He opens a new packet of uh, jetons, which are the French cigarettes he smokes, takes a call from the band's manager, then picks up his Les Paul and peels off some blues licks. So Slash has things on his mind, things he can't talk about, and then he asks the reporter, when is the article going to come out? He asks later. May? He smiles, thinks should be very interesting in May. So even by then, it seemed like they wanted to have Scott out of the band. It's 20 minutes to go, and then Velvet Revolver will rock Dubai, screams a voice over the PA. It's 7.40 p.m. at the Dubai Desert Rocks Festival, and it's gone dark. Slash Duff, Matt, and Dave, who all got the, who basically got on the bus at 5.30 p.m., are sitting under the strip lighting in the trailer backstage. Scott Weiland is, you know, um, like seriously, where the F is Scott Weiland? So 15 minutes to go to Velvet Revolver. Panic is setting in. People leave VR's trailer, tapping furiously on their Blackberries. Mobile phones light up the dark, and their owners disappear between the trailer to whisper urgently. The tour manager, Pete, stands with his arms fo- uh, folded facing the artist's car park. Where the F is he? The sound of Green Day's basket case pounds out from the stage. At 7.48 p.m., a silver car pulls up. Someone shouts out the backstage area, it's okay, it's okay, and Scott Wallen walks from the car. Skinny and bearded, shades on, head down. If it looks like he goes in the VR trailer, then it looks are deceiving. Sure, he goes in the same door, but where the rest of the band sit in a room to the right, Wallen turns left into the area, which is his, which is basically his loan. Photographer Halfin, who knows both camps personally, is the only person to move between two dressing rooms. Since landing in the Middle East the night before, none of the four musicians of Velvet Revolver have spoken to their singer. When, the, when they come out of the dressing room, says Halfin, we'll walk with them to the stage, right? So at 8, 4, 8 or 4 p.m., Matt, Dave, Duff, and Slash emerge from the dressing room. There's a bit of awkward loitering and then a very weird sound. Wallen's assistant, known to in the camp as Little Scott, comes out of the dressing room holding a ghetto blaster over his shoulder. So on their way to the stage, the photographer basically tells the band to, to basically pose for a photo. And that photo you see in the article is the very last group shot of Velvet Revolver before they broke up. So somebody shouts at the photographer, they're supposed to be on stage five minutes ago. It'll just take a second, barks Halfin. Scott, you stand there in the middle. Wallen does as he's asked. Maybe he's already understands the significance. The picture will be the last group shot ever taken of Velvet Revolver. So during this part of the tour, Scott Weiland starts to hear voices. He thought he heard them in Manchester, and he knows he heard them in Leeds. He doesn't know where they're coming from, but each night on stage for the past few gigs, he's heard them distinctly. He stops singing, and there it is, another voice singing his vocal part. His vocal part, somewhere along the line, he decides that Matt Sorum, or possibly Matt's drum tech, is undermining him by singing along with the lead vocals. His relationship with Sorum is an all-time low. The drummer, Scott, thinks has some kind of problem with singers, always has, from Ian Asbury in The Cult to Axel and GNR. He's picked the wrong guy to F with this time. So in Glasgow on March 20th, Scott hears someone else singing and turns to see if Sorum's drum tech is in the back of the stage with a microphone. He flips. Out of the sight of the crowd, there's a spot of RG Bargy. He gets back to the mic and tells the crowd that they're watching something special, the last tour by Velvet Revolver. And after Fall to Pieces, he leaves the stage. Duff hadn't even heard Wallen's comment. I don't wear in-ear monitors, he says, so I don't hear a lot of the shit he says, but I knew something had happened, and there was like this you and then booze, but I really didn't know that. Backstage, there's shouting and drama and people explaining to Wallen that, yeah, Matt's drum tech does have a mic, but only so that he can talk to the monitor engineer, which is a standard practice on tour of this size. No one can explain what Scott is hearing, whether it's a technical fault or an echo or just his imagination, but it's not Matt or his tech, and 15 15 minutes later, the gig continues. The next day, Matt decides to do a bit of damage control by posting on his blog. He said, being in a band is a lot like being in a relationship. Sometimes you just don't get along, and unfortunately, some people in the business don't realize how great of a life they have. Touring the world, meeting great people and fans all over the world, and just playing music for a living, I feel truly blessed. But sometimes, the road can be draining for some. Being away from home and family does grind on you sometimes. And with all the traveling and different beds, personally, I love this shit, and sometimes I can't believe I'm so lucky to still be doing this for a living. So later on in the interview, um, Duff mentioned how Scott's attitude started to change. And he basically said that it was hard for them to be close, him and Wyland. He basically said he demanded to travel separately, have his own dressing room, just kind of not be part of the band because he sees himself as a star and not part of the band. 
God, maybe, but you don't need to be, you don't need to do this around us, says Duff. So he suggests the band were jealous of the attention he got as a frontman and star. No, it certainly didn't have anything to do with that. Who's the bigger star, says Duff. There's never been an issue for me. Shit, man. You know, I got into music really for the love of music. It's never even been really for getting pussy or any of that kind of stuff. And definitely not for being on the cover of magazines or that kind of shit. That was something we just never talked about. Oh, dude, you're getting a lot more press than me. That's embarrassing for me. So in Duff's book, he would elaborate a bit more on exactly when things started to go downhill for Velvet Revolver, and it really started to happen in the middle of 2006 when the band regrouped to write their follow-up album to Contraband, which would be Libertad. So he basically said, Velvet Revolver regrouped to start writing songs for our next second album. Even though Scott didn't tell me or any of the other guys directly, I knew there had been murmurs of a Stone Temple Pilots reunion at tour at some point in the future. On the face of it, I didn't have a problem with that. Though it annoyed me that it was all kept hush-hush, his sneaky behavior created suspicion and tension, and in the tight space of a band, that stuff can get unhealthy fast. As we created songs for the record, new rumblings began. First, Scott demanded to write all the lyrics this time around. We reluctantly agreed. I thought it was a waste of everyone else's talents. Plus, it made me write music differently. Up to now, lyrical ideas had always informed the way I conceived of songs, but fine, this was a concession I could make to keep the band made happy. Then Scott decided he wanted a bigger share of the publishing rights because he'd written all the lyrics. Oh boy, this was the typical stuff where I'd come from. Success bred greed and megalomania. Still, I figured we could talk about it. We could come to a workable solution, and I knew Scott was a smart guy and would listen to reason. I kept calling him, leaving him messages, let's have coffee, let's talk over it, face to face. Finally, when I didn't hear back from him, I sent Scott an email I, using an analogy to express my problem with his demand. A group of guys build houses together, but suddenly one of them insists on building the roof by himself, even though they had previously constructed the first class roofs altogether. So the rest of the team agrees to concentrate on the foundation and the walls while the other guy builds the roof. The day comes when the house is complete and the man who built the roof asks for more money. The roof is the most important part, he says, because it keeps the rain out. Would you describe that as fair, Scott? A large part of the business is dialogue and compromise, and I suggest that we as a band try a little of both. No reply. The issues were left unresolved, but the album eventually called Libertad got finished. As we prepared for its release in July of 2007, we booked an appearance on Jimmy Kimmel's TV show. After the performance, we were finally going to sort out the rod at the band meeting at a suite in the Roosevelt Hotel, a short walk from Kimmel's studio on Hollywood Boulevard. My hope still was that we'd be able to sit down calmly, put everything on the table, and discuss it like businessmen. Yelling and screaming was no longer my preferred method of negotiation. Unfortunately, Scott was drunk and level-headed discussion was not in the cards. Nothing was accomplished before the meeting devolved into yelling and screaming, and then Scott and Matt squared off as if they were going to fight. I walked out, and that's when management stepped in to avert a disaster. They probably saw the value in VR going back out on tour. I knew that if Scott started swinging at Matt, their gig might be up. They basically took cuts in their own commissions to get Scott to clo- basically close to what he wanted. It seemed as if Scott was chuckling through the rest of the talks. If you ask me, the managers should have held their ground, but at least they were actually doing something, which was a new experience for me. Velvet Revolver headed out on tour for the rest of the summer. And instead of things being really well because Duff was sober, so was Slash. Um, instead, things fell apart. Scott went back to dabbling in crack and pills. I felt bad for him in a lot of ways. He was a shell of a cool guy I've gotten to know quite well, and his marriage was falling apart again. He traveled separately from us and began to show up late and make our crowds wait around, often drawing booze from our fans. Hadn't I been through this all before? His performances started to suffer. One time he even nodded off right in the middle of a song only to come up again, singing the wrong part of the song, and the crowd realized and started to heckle him. So by the time Dubai came around, the band had a band meeting without, basically without Scott and decided to kick him out of the band. Now here's an interview with Slash on Howard Stern Show from 2012 where he reflected back on what happened as things fell apart in Velvet Revolver. Well, if you don't care, forget it, then you I know, don't care. I mean, look, look at you? your, but look at your history for a second. Uh-huh. So then you leave this fucking Guns N' Roses and uh, Mm. the coolest band in the world, even the logos and everything else, just cool. Every kid wanted to tattoo it on themselves. Then you hook up with this uh, guy from, um, what's his name? Stone Temple Pilots, Pilots, Weiland, Scott Weiland, who I know. And here we go again. You say, uh, I believe. That that wasn't even fun. Like at the time when I saw you with him, <laughs> you were like, "Yeah, man, this is great because you're trying to sell it." Yeah, yeah. But but you know, it was horrible too, right? Yeah, you but think- you know that was you know all things considered, you know that was something that I think we knew going into it what we were getting into that it was going to be a we disaster. Wa- we just wanted to play. The yeah. idea of Scott came up. And uh, I was the only guy in the band that didn't know Scott. Yeah. I didn't really know much about his history. I'd heard some crazy stories about STP, but uh, right. You know, Duff and I were like fresh out of detox, right? Oh, God. And we thought, we can fix this guy. 
<laughs> but you know what happened was, with, all, with all fairness to Scott, he right. was a mess when we when we got going. But we wrote a couple of good songs and. Um, but then, but you don't the, like him personally. No, I, actually, I like him better not in a band with him than I do <laughs> in a band with him. Right. What was what went wrong? Did you see a lot of Axel-isms well, in I mean, him? Well, I there was a lot of it was you know uh, diva shit, uncontrollable diva stuff, like know? the separate dressing room again. Yeah, I mean, just you know, like like serious rock star stuff that I was just like, what know, is I serious rock star stuff? Give me an example. That's just when your just your sense of entitlement is just to Off the point the of being so inconsiderate to the people around you that does it go from you, you can't work in a group situation you've got a crew you've got management you've got the guys in the band you've got all these people all sort of working together as a team and you got this one guy that has decided he's going to dictate to everybody what's going to happen then not even show up right you know and so the behaviors wow. become everything from where's my green tea with the and uh, why's my honey not <laughs> i can't here? find my shoes in my hotel room i can't you know. right, right literally they right, become gonna, like infants i'm gonna get some coffee i'm gonna wander down the street and then you can't find him and it's five minutes to show time just like you know uh it's classic stuff but anyway and does he ever apologize and say Gee, no, i'm sorry i mean yeah. actually you know what happens is is uh uh it, it's a chemical thing or something where they just don't realize they're doing anything wrong, and that's when it's. Where actually, does that entitlement come from? Does it come from a mother who never said I no? Think it's just fucking extreme narcissism. It is. It's like no empathy but for the anyone. But drugs hmm. create that. Do you drugs think? help. Yeah. 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 Well, drugs, they're going to they're going to intensify those drugs feelings. and booze, you know, and, and egos and all that stuff. We all have them. You know, I mean, it's not like yeah. like uh, I'm I'm fucking innocent of all this shit. But there's an extreme that you can go to where it just makes everything a miserable yeah. process. That diva stuff I don't get because I would be embarrassed. You know what I mean? I well, mean, I mean, it doesn't matter what you do as long as you show up and you, and 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 you perform and you perform and you sort of treat treat the people around you uh, with enough respect so that they can. How do you end do that whole their, situation though? How do you end Velvet Revolver? Like, do you just call up Scott and go, "Look, man, well, we can't deal with this anymore"? There was, a, I think, we canceled. Um, Australia for the second time. <laughs> yeah, that's kind of good. Have you seen him since? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that does it for today's video, guys. Thanks for watching. Let me know your thoughts on Scott Weiland getting fired from Velvet Revolver and uh, whether you were a fan of the band or not. Let me know in the comments section below. Be sure to hit the like button and subscribe if you love GNR as much as I do. And go check out GNRcentral.com for the latest and greatest Guns N' Roses news sticker. Hey, this is Dizzy Reed from Guns N' Roses, and you're watching GNR Central. Yeah!